Over to you, Joe. Let me uh, stop sharing. Okay. Thanks very much, Imrana. Really, uh, really a wonderful overview, and uh, I think you're making a great, uh, great impact there. Uh, if anybody has a, a question, you can. Uh, I see Susanna. Uh, so Susanna's right at Melcho, and okay, so. I'm just going to go the order I saw them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> go ahead, Susanna. Or, okay. Are people's hands going down now? Or? No. Uh, does any? Yep. Uh, I was uh, just, uh, I just wanted to give compliments to Imrana. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Melcho, did you have a question? Okay, uh, there is another person, Henry. Okay, uh, let me. Uh, there is a, yes, Henry uh, Pinedo. Uh, okay, Henry, you can unmute and you can ask, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just want to comment that it was a very motivating uh, presentation. In fact, uh, when I joined the course, I didn't have in mind uh, this other role that we should have as a professor uh, to continue. In fact, I'm a radio frequency person, but uh, as I said, I, from my former generation, uh, I've got also optics. And I knew that the optics, IOSA has a lot of support and also perhaps as part of, in one part of the course, I would like to, to request that maybe you can share uh, these uh, opticals back that they were offered, I think, in time when I was studying in which uh, they contain many type of experiments or what type of materials you were using. So anybody in other part of the world what can replicate these uh, efforts to, to promote optics and of course to promote that uh, young students uh, get involved on time. Very motivating and uh, congratulations for this good uh, uh, labor uh, in Rana. I really was motivated for it from your okay. presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, you know that for LIDAR, it is, uh, you are, as you mentioned during the introduction that you are working on LIDAR. So uh, we decided to do uh, hands-on activity on LIDAR, but uh, you know, all the equipment is very expensive. So we made some models and today we did an activity uh, based on those models. We explained uh, on a board, the uh, working principle of LIDAR, radar, sonar, everything. But I made a toy kind of models. You can give, uh, and I can share everything with you on online. If you use, uh, I will take your email address from uh, Professor Nevela and we can do that. Thanks for your nice comments. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm going to take, uh, we can take one more comment from Anna and then we need to move on. So Anna? Uh, now, as usual, I want to congratulate Imrana for this uh, wonderful work she's doing. My question is, uh, do you have the sensation that uh, all this activity has already produced some um, um, more uh, feeling of the students for optics and science? Do you see a uh, result. Uh, yes, Anna. Uh, let me comment because uh, there are uh, we visited Fatma Jana University a couple of times, so we repeated and we uh, have the feedback. We were doing the follow up of those activities. Similarly, with some uh, government colleges, we did uh, kind of follow up. So uh, now, uh, as I mentioned, that in uh, uh, this was my first activity in last April when we uh, went to a primary school. It is not a right age to enjoy the right kind of uh, optics activities, but that was really, really we. Me, it was uh, me and uh, Abdul Rahman only. Those girls, we have uh, girls were seventy, and we have ten reflect views to draw an image. The, they wanted to grab one reflect view, the force and everything uh, to learn and hold of those things to do it by themselves. It was really, and we will go to them again uh, by the end of uh, this year to see how they react to us. Because in the beginning of that activity, those girls were very shy, very close. But after two, three hours, it was fun to be with them. And similarly with different girls, we, uh, they, uh, it makes a difference. 
but there are so many schools, so many colleges, so many to do. And we are not able to visit all these institutes uh, uh, every year. So because last two years with pandemic, even uh, I tried hard to reach out to uh, many uh, universities and this thing, but it is still not enough. We need to do and move on from lower level to higher level and then see the result. Yeah, that sounds like a very general uh, theme for, for all of us. There's so much to do and so yeah. little time and, and resources to do it. It's a big so, job. It's a big yeah. job. And so, is doing a, a yeah. big job. Thank so, you. Absolutely. Thank you. So thanks very much, Imrana, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, keep up the good work. I can't wait to get Thank back you. to Pakistan. Uh, Thank you. And join in. I'll bring my camera. So, okay, so John Freddy is here, and let me let me just introduce him really, really quick. So John Freddy uh, Barrera Ramirez. Um, um, so he's a professor yeah. of Physics at Physics Institute of Antioquia University. I probably killed that in Colombia. Uh, he was uh, uh, ICO ICBP Galliano Donardo awardee. Uh, he's he's a regular associate of the ICBP. Uh, one of the 30 scientists out of under 40 years old that are doing promising research, uh, which was uh, uh, revealed by Latina, Latin America Science. Um, he's an OOPTIC uh, senior member, uh, SBIE senior member, um, and he's part of the Young Affiliates Network of the World Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's won many awards in, in Colombia, National Research Awards. Um, and uh, he's, he's got uh, two patents as well. At any rate, so uh, he's been uh, very active and he's, he's also coming here to ICDP. So I'm looking very much forward to, to seeing him again in a couple of weeks. So John Freddy, uh, he's gonna talk about uh, uh, optical encryption and optics in Colombia. Uh, and he's, uh, and so at any rate, I'm looking very much forward to your talk and I'll hand it over to you. So you can go, I think you can share your screen. Joe, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, you can see my presentation? Yep, you need to go into presentation yeah. mode, but. Okay, me? Okay, sorry. There. Okay, <laughs> good evening, afternoon or? Uh, or morning, depending on where you are. My name is John Freddy Barrera Ramirez, professor of the uh, Physics Institute at the University of Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia. I'm a, I am also a regular associate of ICTP. The purpose of this talk is present the work that we have done in optical encryption, and also I will to present the, the state of optical research in Colombia. Okay, uh, then me, okay. I live in Colombia here in the city of Medellin. Here you can see a view of my part of my city. The main campus of my university is here, near to the Medellin River. And he, he, this is part of the metro system of my city. I am the coordinator on the Optics and Photonics Group. This, taken, this, this photo was taken recently in the main campus of my university. It was a cloudy day, quite a shame. Here we have the most members of my group. We are six teachers with, with some undergraduate and graduate students. And here you can see the members of the research line on optical information processing. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about encrypted system. As you know, encrypted system allowed to, to protect information. But over the years, many of the encrypted system that were originally taught to be secure but by finally broke. Why we talk about optical encryption? Because optical encryption offers some advantages. For example, the processing is performed at the speed of light and optical systems provide several degree of freedom like polarization, wavelength, or phase. And the most important thing, we use a physical key instead of a digital key like in digital protection systems. The basic definition of a crystal is why it's quite simple. It's the process to convert one data in an encrypted image. This encrypted image is a nonsense pattern 
And this work is done with a decryption system. This encryption system contains a key element called security key. This element allows to convert information in the encrypted image and also recover it when you have the security key. And the decryption is the process of converting, recovering the information from the encrypted data. In that way, you have the encrypted information and the security key. Using both data, you can recover the information. The security of the process in based on the following idea. If one user intercepts the encrypted information but doesn't have the security key, the information cannot be recovered. It still remains hidden. In this way, this is, the system protects the information. The fifth proposal of an optical encrypted system was the double random phase encoding technique. It was proposed in 1995. This system was implemented in a 4F architecture. You can see this encryption system contains two lens of focal length F, lens one and lens two, a two random face mask. One random face mask in the input plate uh, and the second random mask in the first Fourier plane. If we insert the object in the input plane, I illuminate the system with a plane wave. In the output plane, we update decrypted data. You can notice that decrypted data is a noisy pattern due to the use of the two random face mask. The encrypted image is, is then the information, the convolution be between the information in the input plate with the Fourier transfer of the security key. Then the decryption system is also, is also a 4F system. It's a 4F system because contains, because the distance between the input plane and the output plane is 4F, where F is the focal length of the lens. For decrypted information, I, as I said, we use the encrypted object, in this case, the complex conjugate, and in the first Fourier plane, we place the security key. With both data in the output plane, we can recover information. In this way, we can use a 4F system with two random face masks to encrypt and then decrypt the information. Once we can encrypt and decrypt one data, the next step is encrypting and decrypting multiple data. How, how we can do? Using multiplexing. Suppose that we have n objects for O1 to ON, we encrypt each object in the system individually, and then we obtain each encrypted data, E1, E2, EN. And then we add all the encrypted data in only one package. This package is called multiplexing. What is you say? They say you have all the encrypted data in only one data called multiplexing. Now, how we can recover the data? It's simple. If you obtain the multiplexing, when you use key one, you recover object one and the other information remains hidden. And the same, if you have the multiplexing and the key two, you can recover object two. In this way, you can send this multiplexing to any user, to any users and each user can win, go with one only key can recover only one data. This is the purpose. Send all the inform over information in one package and each user only recovers one data. But we, has, we have a very big problem when the, you manage multiple encrypted data. For example, in figure E, you can see one object that was decrypted and encrypted using uh, the, the, the 4F system. But in figure B, you can see one object recovered when we have the multiplexing of 30 objects. What happens if I have the multiple encrypted data, 30 objects in the multiplexing, and I'm trying to recover one of the objects. First, we obtain the recovery, the recovery of the object, so I can see here in the background, but the 29 non-recovered objects introduce noise on the recorded plane. In this case, you can now notice, you can now distinguish the object because the noise due to the other objects. This was a, a very hard problem for optical encryption because, because set a limit on the number of objects that you can encrypt and decrypt successfully. Now we found that we can solve the problem modulating the encrypted objects. What is modulating? It's, it's quite simple. We have the encrypted data. We multiply this encrypted data by, by a sinusoidal rating and we obtain 
and encrypted and modulated data. If we apply a Fourier transform over this data, we obtain the diffraction orders where the diffraction orders contain the information of the encrypted data. We are going to use this concept of modulation to encrypt and decrypt successfully multiple data. In this case, suppose we apply this process to encrypt a movie. As you know, a movie is a sequence of frames projected with set of frequency. We have here the frames from F1 or Fn, and we encrypt all frames using the 4F system. We obtain E1 is the encrypted frame F1. Gn is a grating, and we, we multiply the encrypted object E1 by the grating Gn, G1, we obtain an encrypted and modulated frame. In this case, we can do the same for all the frames, and then we add together all these modulated encrypted objects. Then the encrypted movie is only one data, is the adding of all modulated and encrypted frames. In this case, we have only one data, the package with all the information encrypted and modulated of the video. For recovering the video from this multiplexing, we applied a Fourier transform operation here, and in the Fourier plane, we obtain the diffraction orders. It, each diffraction order contains the information of one specific encrypted frame. In this case, we filter each of the diffraction orders here, and after a Fourier transform, we can select each encrypted frame. In this case, we obtain the complex conjugate of each encrypted frame. We put, we, we can extract from this multiplexing each, each encrypted frame without the superposition with the other frames. Now, simply we use the 4F decryption system and recover all the frames that were encrypted and modulated. In this, in this way, we can encrypt a lot of, a lot of frames, a lot of data, and recover it independently. In that way, you can recognize every object in the movie. Now, in, 2000, in 2011, we published the first video encrypted optically, or by optical means. Here, you can see the reconstruction of the video. Look at using the right decryption process, but we, if we use a wrong key, look at this, we cannot recover the object. The, 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 the movie is still encrypted. The, this, this paper was covered for, for the Spotlight on Optics section of Optical Society. Then we extend this procedure to encrypt color, color movies. You can do it for each channel and encrypt movies in the same way that you can do it for one movie. Like that, look at this. Okay, there are several encryption systems. We saw the 4F encrypted system, but one of the most used encrypted architectures are the JTC. If you look at the system, this is a 2F system. System is the, because 2F is the distance between the input object, input plane, to the recording plane. We use a single lens F and in the input plane, we have the object multiplied by a random face mask and a random face mask that constitute the encryption key. If you apply, if you illuminate a plane wave in the Fourier plane of the lens, we obtain the yaw power spectrum. We can record that spectrum, for example, with a CMOS or CCD camera. And processing this yaw power spectrum, we can obtain the encrypted data. Here, the encrypted data is the product between the Fourier transfer of the object by a random face mask and the Fourier, the conjugate of the Fourier transfer of the security key. Here we have the encryption information, but we, we need the information of the security key. For doing so, we, we block the information of the object and we use a reference arm to obtain here the hologram of the Fourier transfer of the key. Then we use a single arm to obtain the 
encrypted data, but we need an interferometer arrangement to obtain the hologram of the Fourier transform of the key. The decryption system is also simple. It's a 2F system. In the input plate, we put the encrypted image on the Fourier transform of the key, and in the plain key, we obtain the decrypted data. This is another way to encrypt and recover the information. Then we extend the, port, the first proposal of one movie to encrypt multiple movies. For example, we have three movies. We encrypt the first and the last movie with one key. And then we encrypt a third movie, the second one here, with other key. We add all, all these encrypted uh, movies together and look at here, here in A, with the recover with the key one, we can recover the first movie, while the second is still, is still hidden, and the last one can be recovered. On the, in reverse, on the contrary, if we use the second key, the first movie is still encrypted, the second is recovered, and the third one is still encrypted. We, we, we publish a lot of uh, practical applications. One of the most interesting is this application where we are protecting messages or of any length. We use one optical key. What we will do is, is encrypt every character of a keyboard. Then we multiplex all characters and then using the optical key, the security key, we recover the keyboard. In this case, this is the keyboard. And using a selection, selection position key, we can recover any message. Look at here, the message is information security through light. The security of the system is covered by the optical key, by the random key, but this selection position key allows to recover any message of any length. This work was selected like highlights of 2013 for the Journal of Optics, and also was included in IOP Select uh, in IOP platform. We demonstrate that it is possible to encrypt from a single character, a structured objects, one movie, several movies, color movies, messages of any length. But you, you can see here, you can notice that all recovered data has noise. This noise is a very big problem because users, one user requires safety. This is the optical system provides safety, but high fidelity recovering. We need recover, for example, this photo, but without noise. But what's the problem? Optical system use random face mask and does random face mask produce this noise. Some researchers try to reduce this noise between them us using optical and digital techniques, but none of the proposed methods allow to remove this noise. We were working at least 10 years trying to remove this noise. We can reduce this noise, but we, can, we, we couldn't remove it. But the answer was knowing the optical of digital techniques using for optical, optical or digital processing. The answer was in the quick, in the quick response codes, the QR codes. Now they are very pop popular, but in 20, in 2020, is, uh, they are very popular, but in the past were not so pop popular. Now they are, they are two-dimensional barcodes employed to store information. These QR codes were invented in 1994 to track vehicles during manufacture and has a lot of advantages. They are fast reading, they are tolerant to noise. Be careful with this, tolerant to noise, loss, and misalignment. And the most important thing for us is the use of QR codes is free of any license. We can use it and there are no licenses. Look at this idea. We have an object, optical encryption. If you use our system, you can you recover, you encrypt and decrypt the, the data, but the recovered data has noise due to the processing with random face mask. Or the while is combining optical encryption and QR code. Look at this. 
Optical encryption was proposed in 1995 and QR coding in 1994, but for different purposes. Here, what we will do is the data is converted in a QR code and we encrypt the QR code instead of the information. Here in the image C, we have the encrypted QR code. If we apply the encryption process, you recover the noisy decrypted QR code. But as I told you, the reading of these QR codes is tolerant to noise. You can recover from this noisy QR code the original information without noise. If you apply the conventional procedure, you recover the, the information, but with this, this noise. In conclusion, if we use optical encryption and QR codes, you can protect information and also recover it free of any kind of noise. This, this work was published in Office Express and was covered by Nature Photonics in his session, Research Highlights with the, with the article, Quick Response Codes. We also prepare a patent of this, of this system called Optophysical Apparatus and Procedures for encrypting information and it's covering, recovering free of noise. In, in this point, everything was done from the point of view of basic research. Here, you can see a movie of the optical setup in my laboratory in Medellin. Look at the typical elements, mirror, polarizer, and spatial modulator to project the information, CCMOS camera, one mirror, polarizers. And after this work, we decide to make a prototype of this encryption system. Here is a top view of the prototype with all the elements involved here. And in this video, I'm going to show you the prototype. Look at here. The, the optical system is here in this black box. And the, the idea is that you can control all the system with that one software that we develop. This is, again, a top view of the system. Here you can see the components. It's, this system is a compact version of the setup that we use for basic research with almost the same elements. Here we can see some difference, but in general, it's almost the same setup. A splitter here, a polarizer here, a mirror, a CMOS camera. And there's a change here. The projection system is a digital micromirror device. Instead of a special line modulator, it's a less costly element. We construct a generator of one of his mask. And here a shooter to register the, the optical key. As I said, we prepare a, a software that controls the, the optical system. We can insert the information, for example, here from the computer. You can insert alternative GTC. This is the, the message you can protect. And the system generates the corresponding QR code. Then, we encrypt the data using the optical system and obtain the security key. Then with both information, we can record in the original data. This, this works in several domains for your fractional. Here are some parameters you can change, but in general, we decrypt the data of the security key. You decrypt the QR code, after reading the QR code, you can recover the information free of any kind of noise. In the, uh, this has a lot of steps. It, was, it wasn't easy from the basic research to a prototype for me it was uh, extremely difficult because we, we never have the experience to do things like that. And it's, it's very difficult. It was very difficult for us. Okay. On summary, we start to encrypt a decrypt single data, like a character, for example, the letter E, to more structured objects like QR codes 
Also, we create we, we create new codes, new codes for recovering information free of noise. Also, grayscale information we pass to color information. Uh, and in these days, we we are able to encrypt and decrypt color and structure information. Here, to the right, you can see the record the description of a movie or a real movie of a 3D and color object. Look at this description. It's a three-dimensional object in color. Here, here you can see the evolution from a single letter to a real, to a real movie. Uh, our last, our last contribution is a compact encryption system. They pay attention. Look at. For the JTS encryption system, we use one setup to obtain the encrypted data. It's on, and only one app. But if you want to record the security key, you have to use an interferometric arrangement. You have to add this arm, this reference arm, to the system. OK? What is our idea? We want to record the encrypted data and the encryption key using a single arm set up for in both cases. Look, for recording the encrypted data and in, the, uh, recording the encrypted key. In this way, we propose and um, published one contribution then the, where we show that it's possible to encrypt and, and to record the encrypted, the encrypted information at the security key without need for a reference arm. What we do, what's simple, when we are projecting the information of the, the security key, we add one window that acts like, like a reference arm. In this way, we can record, record the encrypted image and the security key using the same system, one arm system. Results in a significant decrease in the size, the quantity of elements, look at this, look at this setup, the size and the, this, or the quantity of elements due to this reference arm and this setup that has an, a reference arm. The results that in a decreasing of size, the quantity of elements and the complexity of the system. And in this point, I want to, to say you that you can do basic research with low cost setups. What does it mean? It depends of the, of the pocket, but the low cost setup, for example, you can implement this setup with buying the, the components in a, the appropriate place, maybe by $3,000 to $4,000. And you can do basic research with this money. You always think that you need big, big labs with a lot of elements. Not always, not always. Sometimes it is possible to do good research with low cost setups. This is a message that you are going to receive in the next talk with my friend Umberto. Uh, and this point, also, I want to, to say that we have a scientific collaboration of our group with the ICTP Optics Laboratory in the frame of the program TRIL. It's a program for training and research in Italian laboratories. Under, under this, this program, one of our students, of our PhD students, uh, was in the ICTP Optics Laboratory with Umberto and Joe. Uh, they, they, he was there two months trying to, to combine optical encryption, that is our, our topic here in Medellin, with the topic of Umberto and Joe in ICTP lab, that is thermal less effect. And after two months of working there, my students, uh, we were able to publish this year, this paper in Journal of Optics, Optical Encryption Using Modulation Generated by Thermal Less Effect. This is an opportunity for you, if you want to, to work in research, maybe apply to this time of programs that are very, very useful for, for young researchers. Uh, I'm going to, to use the last part of my talk to, to talk about the state of optics in Colombia as an isometric analysis. This is very important because you never know how it's, it's working in your country along the, along, along the years. And it, it, this study was published this year and it's very interesting. This, a study were determined using 
the research articles published by authors with Colombian affiliation in journal index in the Scopus database. All was taken from the Scopus database belonging to atomic and molecular physics and of this subject category. Very important facts, even for me. The first work in Colombia in this topic was in was published in 1973. We have two periods, 1944, 1979, and 1981 to 1988, with without publications. But for 1999, the publications climbed rapidly until 2000, 2002. And we have 135 publications. Here we can see the Optis research groups. The first group was created in 1972. It was our group. From 1973 to 1979, no, no group was created in this period. Most groups were created until 2005, where the number of the new groups start to decrease. And these 10 frames co coincide with the return to the country of many Colombians with PhD in optics or related areas. For example, in this, in this time, in this time frame, a lot of researchers that were to do the PhD alongside, they return to Colombia and start to publish. Mm -hmm. Here is the distribution of the groups in Colombia. We have 61 groups in optics on related areas. Look at here in red, we have the group from 2003 to 2010. You have most of group here, look at. we created a lot of group in, in that time from 2003, 2010. And from 2011 to 2020, start to decrease the number of new groups. You can see the groups are, are concentrated in the most concentrated in the administrative departments with more gross domestic product, the biggest departments, more populated. Talking about the general productivity between 2016 to 2020, we can see that in 2016 we're published 114, while in 2020 we published 202. It was an increment of 77.2%. The, the productivity increased year, year by year with an average of 169 per year from 2016 to 2020. Another important fact, look at here, the percentage of international collaboration in 2016 was 64.9 and in 2020, 61.9. Or it does, it, it, this International collaboration was above 60%, except for one year. And the percentage of output in Q1 for 2016 were 20.2, and for 2020, 30.2. It was an, a, a huge increment here from 2016 to 2002. Six institutions contribute with more than 50 papers. This is institution have their green campus in the three administrative departments with most of these opportunities research groups. Look, look at this. The first Universidad Nacional de Colombia and Universidad Nacional de Antioquia are public universities. Universidad Nacional de Colombia is the biggest university in Colombia and it's a national university. And Universidad de Antioquia is a departmental university. Look at the number of documents. Also, the Universidad Nacional de Colombia published 2.6 times more documents than Universidad de Antioquia. The Universidad Nacional de Colombia, look at, look at here the value, 6.5, 13.13. Has, has half as many citations per document than University of Antioquia. So I used to say that the impact of the documents for the University of Antioquia is very low. Look at this, this, this data. Top seated documents in patents between 2011, 2020. You can find here, Common Journal for Optical Society, Optical Express, Optical Letters, and Applied Optics. But it's interesting to note that there are three 
contribution in proceeding of SPI, showing that this proceedings has a, a, a high impact in technological uh, aspects. Oh, here, look at this interesting slide. Top 30 journal with most published articles between 2016, I'm sorry, between 2016 to 2020. You can see here the classical journals from Optical Society, Applied Optics, Optic Letters, Optics Spread, some severe journals, look at here, Optics Communication, Optics and Laser and Engineering, Optics and Laser Technology, and some e triple E journals in the bottom. It's, it's very important because we have all journals are Q1 or Q2, except for three, Q3, look at that here in blue, Q3, Optical Engineering, European Journal of Physics Journal D, International Journal of Energy, and only two Q4. Those are Optica Pre Applicada and Journal of Nonlinear Optics, Physics and Materials. Regarding the productivity between 2003 and 2020, you can see here 2003, 35 papers, and in 2020, 2020, 202. An increment factor of 5.8 is a, a big increment from 2003 to 2002. The international collaboration in 2003 was 6, 68.6 to 61.9. It's almost the same, above 60. And the output in Q1 remains almost constant, 31.2 to 30.2. You can you, ha you have to notice that this var the, the variation in this in this in this data depends on the new professor that returned from other countries to Colombia to do research and the changes of the funding policies. And also we can conclude the optic research in Colombia and its established area, area of, of, of research with active group groups around the world it will, it with high impact in his products. Uh, finally, Ciao. finally, finally, I, we can see here, look at the general productivity for Colombia in all areas of knowledge. According to Simago Journal and Country Rank, Colombia is in the place 48 of the countries. And we can see here, to the right, a plot with the contribution to Colombia, to the world, Latin America, or, or Iberoamerica. Pay, pay attention on this line, the orange line. This is the contribution to Colombia, to the total production of Latin America, of Latin America. In 2003, the contribution of Colombia was 2.6% of all the contribution of Latin America. While in 2020, in 2020, the contribution was 8.75%, an increment factor of 3.4. This is talking about all the areas of research in Colombia. Then, then we can say the, the, the productivity increased from 2003 to 2020 with this increment factor. And look at this. The increment factor of all areas was 3.4, while the increment factor for optics was 5.8, 5.8. Well, we can say the increment of the optics area was superior, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, was superior to the increment in all areas. The performance on, of the optics research was superior that if we saw all areas. Uh, finally, uh, this work is done with a lot of collaborations. My colleagues from Tokyo University, uh, we work in the, 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 since the beginning in this work. I have, I have active collaboration with Centro Investigaciones Ópticas in Argentina. And now I started a collaboration with one of me, my past students, my Carlos Rios Ocampo, a nice professor in the University of Maryland. Some institutions helped me a lot, my university, the Ministry of Science of Colombia, the Ministry of Science in Argentina, and also the International Center for Theoretical Physics, mainly the program of 
uh, associates. I started uh, as a junior associate and now I'm a regular associate. I'm, I, I am also associate for TUAS, the World Academy of Sciences. Uh, and obviously, are you, in, are you welcome to my university? Thank you very much for, so atten for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John Freddy. Wonderful talk and presentation. Of, uh, it looks like things are picking up uh, in Colombia. And uh, thanks for the advertisement. Mm -hmm. I think we do have a we have a question from uh, Henry, right, uh, Abdul? Uh, yes, uh, Henry. Uh, Henry, you can unmute and ask a question directly from the speaker. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, probably uh, I didn't quite understood the. the when you mentioned that the key is physical. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I was uh, wonder uh, how the decryption process is sensitive to the uh, natural degradation of the materials about the time. So what are the plans uh, or the, uh, what are, I mean, how, how are you thinking to, to solve this possible uh, situation? Uh, any the grid or any physical device, optical device could suffer some degradation with the time. No? So I don't know at, at this point if this is a, a, it's a matter of concern. So this is my just my curiosity, my question, please. Okay, Henry, thank you very much for the question. It's a very interesting question. The key for this optical system is the, the security key, of course. Okay. The security key in this case is a ground glass diffuser. It's a glass with different roundness around the different areas. And usually these, these keys are generated for certain time. For example, you create a 10, 10 security keys and use that key, for example, for one month. Also, there is a, a very interesting topic. You can generate biological, for example, biological uh, keys. These keys has several advantages. For example, you generate the keys, the keys, with a biological uh, matter, and you can use these keys for one month. If you want, see so you capture the, this key and want to to, to register uh, these keys, that the biological system change and the keys are different. And maybe can be a problem, but can be an advantage. You can use the system that has a key that changes to protect the information along the time. Oh. But usually, usually we use uh, glass diffusers. They not shed in time. Oh yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Very, uh, I just take a moment. Welcome, Henry. For one second, for one seconds, just to to tell you that maybe I will contact later. Yeah, how, how to help me to start some optical group here in my university, as I say. So later. You're I welcome. <laughs> Write me an email. Yeah. I am happy to help you. We have to talk. Don't worry, <laughs> don't worry. Thank I you. can help you. <laughs> it's not easy, but you can do it. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great because that that's part of the networking that uh, I remember so fondly from when we were, we were doing these uh, optics colleges over the years uh, here in person at ICDP. Uh, any other questions or I don't see. Uh, okay. Um, well, well thank, thanks very much, John Freddie. That was, that was a really great overview and a, what an interesting topic. Um, uh, so we're going to go into our last last talk today. I just want to remind everybody again, uh, because many